Hi, I'm Barney with Deep Review, and here's Matt Fraser from Panasonic. We're here to talk about the new Lumix LX100. Yes, this is the new LX100, which is our uh, replacement. For I shouldn't say replacement, really. It's a big brother to the LX7. The LX7 continues, right? It's not actually been... Yeah, we're not going to get rid of it. Um, it's sold really well. It's yeah. going to be at a great price point. Still a camera that people are going to want to be able to use because it has the largest sensor mm -hmm. and really fast class. Excellent. So what makes, this, what makes this camera special? What makes it unique? Well, right away, this camera is using a Micro Four Thirds sensor. So it's the same sensor that comes out of the GX7. Right. Um, so it's a, technically it's 16 megapixel, but because the LX series is typically using a uh, multi-aspect function where you can go from 16 by 9 to 4 by 3 to 3, mm. 2 and maintain a roughly the same field of view. Yeah, it's not just a simple crop, is it? No, because it, it, it's frustrating if you just crop down because all of a sudden the field of view is changing on you and you may, yeah. you know, cut out a family member or what have you. We also don't see a massive change in resolution because of the way we do this. So. We wanted to maintain that character with the camera, so what we've done is we're slightly cropping the sensor. I mean, the, the lens is a you know, 24 to 75 millimeter yeah. equivalency. If this was a true Micro Four Thirds uncropped, the lens would say, you know, instead of it being, it was a 12 millimeter, you can see it's only 10.9 millimeter. Right. So it's not a lot of a crop that we're doing, but we're doing it just so we have that multi-aspect function, and that's what gives you the 12.8 megapixel resolution. Right. So this is the same or very similar focal range to the LX7 equivalent. Very well, very very close. Yes, because it's about yeah. about 90 millimeters right. on the LX7. This is 75. So it's it's great if you're a SLR user who is coming from full frame and want to have, you know, a, a terrific walkabout camera that's super lightweight. Mm -hmm. you know, you're probably used to shooting with a 24 to 70 f2.8 constant. Well, you've got 24 to 75 f1.7 yeah. to f2.8 so it's not too dissimilar from you know really one of the most popular walkabout lenses that's out there for professional photographers. Sure. The lens I mean despite the, the imaging area of the one inch sensor sorry the, like the fourth earth sensor is so much bigger. Yeah it's at least the one, one in the LX7. Our marketing says it's 1.6 times bigger than a one inch <laughs> sensor so. Uh, but you managed to put the lens on there is not that much bigger than the one in the LX7. I, mean, I know I've seen some materials that suggest that if you if you use the same optical construction as the LX7, the lens would be, would be vastly bigger. So what changes were made? Yeah, it might be just a little large. It would be yeah. hard to hold because it'd be very heavy in the front. So what we've done um, to, to downsize the optics and not sacrifice optic quality is we're using uh, two ED elements in the, in the optical design. Uh, but we're also using five different aspheric lenses. So of the lenses that are in here, five of them are aspheric. Mm -hmm. And of those five aspheric lenses, you have eight aspheric surfaces. So that's really nerdy stuff out there. But really what that means is we are radically bending light back and forth in order to reduce the size of this lens. Right. And it's a Leica lens, so um, they're, they're a bit picky in particular about what we do with the lens. So it has to still maintain you know, Leica quality for its sharpness. It has to have certain controls for mm -hmm. lens flare, chromatic aberration. And then there, we'll, we'll make sure whether it's in the lens or in the software that the geometry is going to be the way that you would expect a Leica nice. lens to be. So how much collaboration was there with Leica when you were putting this together? So I'm not in the room, unfortunately. I can only sort of share with you uh, what they tell me. So we'll design a lens and we'll work with Leica on a lens design and they'll help us to determine if it's going to meet their standards of quality control. And they'll, they'll profile that optic before we've ever even milled any glass and determine if it's going to work out. Then we mill optics, have them test them again, um, again, lending their collaborative efforts to help us to you know, iron out any hard edges that we may have right. achieved. Um, then there will, well, through the production process, uh, there's actually Leica inspections of the production process. So on each run of glass, it's my understanding that um, every series of lens is pulled and verified that it's meeting spec. Because of our automated manufacturing process, you don't really have to inspect every single lens because if the, if the mold isn't correct, it would be incorrect for every optic on the line. So uh, I think it's also important to note that we have certain technologies that nobody else in the industry has. We have a special new process for making aspheric lenses that no other company than my knowledge uses. It actually requires hand polishing of the actual mold for the lens. So for those of you who don't know, and if you can fall asleep out there if this gets boring, um, when we make an aspheric lens, you have a big piece of metal and you've taken and you've made your shape out of it. And when we do that with a lathe, it creates these funky ridges all throughout. 
those ridges end up getting embedded into the glass. And then when we do our bokeh, you know, where we try to make the bokeh balls, all of a sudden you see these little onion rings mm -hmm. all around. Right. Yeah, yeah. So we're hand polishing with a special process to get those ridges down so that they no longer embed in the aspherics. Right. And that means a very beautiful bokeh in the background. So this is the closest to like a quality that we've ever produced in this lens. Excellent. So I mean, this is a camera that I think to the, to the casual observer looks a lot like a lot of other cameras out there. Uh, you know, you can't see the big sensor necessarily. You can't see all of that technology in the lens. Well, I could take it apart. They could see it once. Right. <laughs> see it once and never work. again. Yes. So in, what's your one sentence pitch? You know, why should someone go and buy this camera rather than anything else? Well, as a point and shoot camera, it can be used by anybody from the most simple, you know, non-photographic expert because mm -hmm. of its IA function to somebody who's looking for you know, extraordinary shallow depths of field and are very, very conscientious of quality. Um, because of this fast lens, because the lens allows so much light in, mm -hmm. it allows us to be able to produce a brighter image with less noise. Because the sensor is so much larger, it allows us to give you shallower depths of field and less noise. Right. I think really what it comes down to is if you want to take a moment and capture it as realistically as possible, without having to go to the trouble of carrying an SLR with massive lenses, this is gonna get you the closest of any camera in the market. Okay, and just finally, this is a, a video camera as well as a stills camera. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention that, didn't Shoots we? 4K, I, I don't, I'll, I'll help you out. No, it's okay. So yes, it is a- <laughs> it, it shoots 4K, right? It, it happens to shoot 4K <laughs> video, yes. It'll do 4K video uh, for the US at either 24 frames per second right. or 30 frames per second. Um, and it, it really is a terrific competitive advantage for the product. Uh, because the video quality, when you bring it in to edit, even if you decide to dumb it down to 1080, you're going to render a much sharper video image. And it's important to note that the camera, we've done away with the fidgety PAS and M mode dial uh -huh. on the top now. Um, so some people who have maybe GH4s, who are used to having the movie menu on here, they're, they're going to look at this like, how do I get this into the manual movie mode? Well, you don't have to think about it anymore. You just put this into the aperture and shutter speed that you want, and you just hit the record button on the back of the camera and now it just records video in the manual modes. You can take, take stills from the 4K, can't you? You've got that, that the photo, is it called photo 4K? Yeah, so we have a photo 4K mode, which is, it's a cool feature. It, um, typically video files on our cameras don't give you any EXIF data. Right. So we'll embed some EXIF data into the video file. We'll also allow you to have different aspect ratios because, uh, you know, as much as I love 16 by nine on my television sets, I probably would prefer 3.2 framing when I go to print. So you can have it framed for 3.2 print, for 3.2 or for one to one or for 16 by nine. Um, and then when you watch the video, it's very simple to capture an image. You just review it from the camera and you can hit the transport forward or transport backward buttons right here. Cause unfortunately there's no else, there's no touch screen on this particular phone, um, camera. Once you get there, you pause, you just press the set button in the middle, mm -hmm. it's gonna ask you, do you want an image? Just say yes, and now you've got a JPEG. Right. So it's, it's really great. Well, thank you very much. That was a good overview. Thanks, Matt. Well, thank you for the time. Yeah. We appreciate it. Thank you for watching.